Hi, I'm Roman with Holistic Dog Training. And I will not be mean today. I will do it as usual. Just give you a heads up that you might see some things that are very disturbing for your taste. So just giving you a heads up. I'm going to let you know before I do so you can look away, for example. Leash training. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> Who doesn't struggle with leash training? So if you guys are struggling with leash training, comment below. It's totally okay. I struggle with leash training also once in a while. And sometimes I do struggle with leash training because some dogs that I get to work with have no leash manners at all. <clears throat> Actually, some of them are so bad that you don't want to know. <laughs> so hi there. Good morning. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> we're having coffee, right? Don't forget that fresh coffee make sure your water your dogs have enough water to drink and are occupied while you're watching <clears throat> and learning mm. you know what you need a coffee or a tea it's kind of like our ritual speaking of rituals <clears throat> leash walking is a ritual and we should be very careful how do we set up this ritual because it can backfire on us. Today, so we're going to talk about how to go through the process and learn with our dogs how to proceed with leash training. Now, it's very important for us to recognize that walking a dog is very, very important to a dog. We're going to talk about thresholds. We're going to talk about leash pressure. We're going to talk about what tools to use and why we shouldn't use specific tools. We will discuss how the relationship between you and your dog is important because for some reason, people think you have to communicate through the leash or through the tools that you use. And so I want you guys um, just be aware that things are not as they look like. Um, and I know you guys have heard a lot of stuff and um, I appreciate my colleagues out there who try to do their best, getting people away from aversive training, or some people are still convinced that that's the best way to go. No offense. I'm going to share with you a couple of ideas that I work over the years, and I saw the work perfectly fine. Okay, just a heads up. They're not mine ideas. It's not like me invented the wheel, right? But I, I saw different things that I saw with different colleagues, and I thought that needs a little bit of improvement, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit twitching. <clears throat> and it's just kind of like doing martial arts where you learn a technique and then you create your own resulting technique because of who you are and what you're dealing with and your dogs and your clients that you attract. So um, leash training is not just one fits all. You don't just take a book and says, oh, leash training, perfect, let's do that. Yeah, I know, it's, it's about food here. Um, food is important too while we're doing leash training. And I, I recognize that many people avoid treats because they believe we don't want to get stuck with treats. I agree with you. However, there is another twitching on that. Uh, some people think that the dog has to be perfectly aligned and super adjusted and needs to be corrected if it doesn't do. We're going to talk about that. Um, I'm Roman with Holistic Dog Training. And I have a different approach in general. My approach is secure attachment relationship approach. I know there is a relationship training out there. My approach is creating the secure attachment bond that guides the dog through the process. If your dog doesn't have a secure attachment with you, why would he pay attention to you? Why would he listen to you? Why would he trust you in the first place? And I know many people says, well, you know, the dog loves me. Yeah, he loves you, no problem. <clears throat> but in crisis, that love is gone and survival mode kicks in, and this is where you usually struggle. And so we want to go ahead <clears throat> and be proactive rather than reactive, teaching the dog who to trust in crisis. What is the safety routine in crisis? <clears throat> what are the options in crisis? What are the situations that we have to deal with in crisis? So for you to understand the whole concept that your dog is struggling with will be the solution to your leash training problem. Will this video solve your problem? I don't know. <clears throat> you be you be the judge. However, I guarantee you, by the end of that video, 
you will have a better outlook of leash training. <clears throat> you will 100% have a better result of the leash training skills that you have. And your dog may be addressed. The leash will be gone or it will be improved. So definitely it's worth looking at it and pay attention because the whole video will give you the instructions. If you skip the first part because you think you know everything, you may end up missing the important pieces because it doesn't come in as a blob. It comes in as structural. It comes in as step by step. Okay. It's not time related. It's event related. Okay. So stay tuned with me <clears throat> and um, let's look about a little bit. So first of all, we should look a little bit into the tools that we have available. And to do so, I will go just to um, Amazon and I will look about dog training. See what Amazon has to offer when I type the dog, dog leash training. And I'm going to share the screen with you because you and me, we're going to look at that. Okay. So let's look at that. Let me share the screen with you. This will be somewhere here. Here we go. Share screen. Here we are. So I just typed here, leash training, pressed on this, and you see what I see, okay? So we have different kind of stuff. We have leashes, we have gentle leader, head collar, we have different type of leashes, we have poop attached leashes, we have harnesses and how they are attached here. Oh, we have, what is that? Dog training collars, uh-huh. It, they call them dog training collars. They're chargeable dog shock collars. At least they are honest about it. What else do we have? We have long leashes. Okay. We have another halty. We have another shock collar. Um, we have short leashes. We have long leashes. We have thin leashes. We have extra long leashes. All these things. Now, which part? Oh, here we have my extra harnesses. So we have belly band harnesses. We have another halty leashes. All these things. What do you guys use? <clears throat> Give me a heads up. And I'm not here to judge. Okay, don't take me wrong. I'm not judging you. You have the right to inform informed decision. And that session or that video today is about you knowing why and what to use. Okay. Whatever you use by the end of that video, it's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to give you the information that I have and you be the judge. If it works for you, it's perfectly fine. If it doesn't, just forget about it. It doesn't have to be. So we see here all these things that we see um, available in the market. Now, let's look about a little bit on dog training collars. There you go. So, dog collars, here you go. We have all these fancy collars. Oh, here we go. We have already shock collars too. We have another shock collar. We have regular collars. We have flea collars. We have another shock collar. Oh, these guys actually explain to us exactly how it's going to happen. Okay. <clears throat> Dogs are running away, destroying things. We're going to talk about that. And night collars. The good thing I have so far. Oh, we have fancy light collars. What else do we have? We have rope collars. We have flat leather collars. We have spike colors, like fancy colors. Good. Okay. That's so good. So very interesting. You can shop all these things on online, I guess, nowadays. And then let's look there. What do we do with aggressive dog colors when we have an aggressive dog and need a color? Here we go. So we have a lot of shock color options. We have Altis. We have plastic prong colors. We have a lot of options of shock colors, spray colors, shock colors, shock colors, choke colors, prong colors. We have special colors. We have shock colors with lights, without lights, with beepsers, without the beepsers. All of a sudden, you see, as soon as you type the dog aggression, it kind of directs you in that thing. And how many of you guys have actually dogs who really responding weird to leashes, right? 
okay, great. You guys, Michael is using a back attachment harness. You're using a martingale. Good. We're going to talk about all these harnesses. What else do you guys use? I'm very interested. And if you use a harness, maybe you want to share why you use that harness or that color or that particular item or training tool that you use. What is your dog's behavior? It's really fascinating. Everything. Oh, that's a cool one. It also gives you a little bit more information. It's a leash with information telling you that the dog needs space. Perfectly. I like it. <clears throat> So interestingly, these are your choices that you have going in the market. So let's go a little bit further and say, okay, I, I don't actually want a collar, I want a harness. What's going on here? Here we go. So we have harnesses. We have this type of harnesses. <clears throat> we have military harnesses. We have V harnesses. Um, they're complicated harnesses, easy harnesses soft harnesses a little bit harder ones we have harnesses that have information on it very clear information cute information so you see there's so much how how do we choose the right thing first of all let's look into do we actually need all this gear to start with what is the situation actually and i see many people that are um, struggling with the leashes, they have all these different ideas of why we should use. Thank you so much for your input. <clears throat> great, great, great information. We're going to talk all about that. I'm going to pull you guys in once in a while. Okay. Was that? Okay. Harness and short leash for walking, long leash when we are in the yard. Perfect. I like that. I brought the martingale collar from English Mastiffs. Good. So, interestingly. So, first of all, we have to talk about, before we make a choice, how old is our dog that we're talking about? And when we talk about the edge, age of a dog, it's very important because we need to be conscious that everything that you do with your dog has to do with you, right? It's a, it's a relationship thing. You and your dog are having a thing. You guys going out for a walk. And it should be a happy thing, right? You are happy going your dog for a walk. And your dog should be happy walking with you. But is that a reality? Because I know many people who go out there and like, Oh, my honey, please take the dog out for a walk. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to take the dog out for a walk. going to bark everywhere. The neighbors will look out the window. Oh, these weird guys are again walking their dogs. <laughs> And you're like, okay, let's go for a walk. You know, I see, I see that. I know, I know. You know, it's totally fine. After watching that video, you don't need a hoodie anymore, right? <laughs> hoodie gone. And you're going to have a regular leash and you're going to have a regular dog. And you can have, from my perspective, two basic choices. A harness is my primary choice. The reason why I would use a harness is because it gives you freedom of movement to your dog, which you want. And at the same time, it gives you kind of a safety control. And then we're going to use also a collar because you have to attach, you know, the tags and the name and your phone number in your address, whatever, depending on if your dog is an escape artist. However, we want to also consider people who are struggling with their dogs who are escape artists from the harnesses and we want to do a double safety. So age of the dog, safety needs is the second choice. And the th next choice would be, what exactly is my dog's behavior that I want to address? Is it a young puppy? Is it an adult dog? Is it a small dog? Is it a big dog? Is it a giant dog? Is it a guardian dog? Is it a hunting dog? What is what I need the dog to do? And what are the dog's treat, pre, blum, breed traits? So we see suddenly we have the dog's age. We have the dog's size. We have the dog's breed traits. Why is this important? Because some dogs need to pull. They get the exercise out of it. They need to kind of to do something very particular. I remember working with dogs like Huskies and other sled dogs that love to pull. But we don't want them to pull on a leash. How, how can we separate that, right? 
um, I think that's a whole you know, event for other sessions. And by the way, for you guys who are interested, I'm having an upcoming class soon. Um, it will be about leash training. And you can go to my website, holisticdogtraining.org slash events, if I remember right. Or you go to my website and click on workshops and they will come up more and more. So very perfectly. <clears throat> also, we have dogs who are doing service with beef other than having breed traits. So service dogs, for example, they need specific harnesses because they need to have some gears on them, like EpiPen, medical alert information, you know, all these needs, some of them for them have structures on it so people can hold on to it, okay? And so when we take the dog and we go shopping for a leash, what do we look for? We look something that fits the dog, fits the size, is adjustable, feels good, it's soft, but not too soft. It's solid, but not hard. Doesn't create any pressure points. And how exactly does it sit on a dog? Um, we should look for a harness that fits our taste, the collar, okay? And we should look a couple of details. I look at details, versity. Can I? Can I do things with it? I have some, I, I love a harness and I don't want to do it advertising here. <clears throat> I like our harnesses who have a front clip on the front, on the chest. And I like one harnesses who have at least one hook on the back, but where the hook sits is important. I don't want the hook to be too far back of the shoulder. I want to be the hook near the shoulder and eventually a backup if I want to, you know, sled the dog or, you know, work, work run with the dog that I have a, a, a hook as far back as possible so the geometry of pulling goes more into the chest rather than to the shoulders. Um, so that was my choice. Then I would definitely would like to have a martingale collar that is closing to a certain amount and not choking the collar the dog and we have to be very careful how we adjust the collar because it's very important that some dogs who have very white neck and narrow head the collar the regular flat collar would slip over it so you are forced to make it very tight right it's a problem because what happens if your dog does exercises and is going out for a walk his blood pressure goes up his vein transport more blood so his whole neck swells and that good fit collar becomes a tight collar that's why usually what we do is we put two fingers in between the collar and the neck, making sure there is enough gap. But if your dog is a greyhound, <laughs> that gap is a problem because that neck is wider than the dog's head, right? So what do you do there? Then we have an issue with how sensitive the dog's neck is. Some dogs have injuries on the neck. So we want to make sure that the size of the collar is appropriate to the dog's necks and needs. A very sensitive neck needs a white collar. A very, you know, proper adjusted dog needs a regular flat collar. Now, the thickness of the wideness of the collar starts from half an inch, three quarters of an inch. I wouldn't go further up. I know I love cane courses. I love Presa Canarios. I love Bulldogs. I love all these giant breeds. And I see many people use those really old fashioned, like really, really ancient fashion Roman Empire collars, where it's a hold really, it's kind of like a safe for the dog neck. Imagine how much information goes through the dog's neck, all the nerves, the veins, you know, the trachea, the air, the flow, everything goes through the dog's neck. In other words, everything that happens in the dog's world is perceived through the head and goes down the neck into the dog's body. So it's very important for you to recognize that, that what you do to the dog, it happens to the dog's neck in one way or the other. And whatever you want to address is not going, supposed to not going through the dog's neck. You should go through your basic communication skills. And so in order to have your dog walking loose on the leash, all we have to do is establishing communications, right? So let me show you something here because I was interested to, um, let me see if I can pull that in. Let me see. Okay. We're going to talk about observing the dog's behavior patterns on a leash. 
But first of all, we have to see what's going on with the dog. Some of you have a rescue dog. Some of you have a foster dog. Some of you just are dog walkers. Some of you are trainers, right? And some of you have just a dog and you want to see how he behaves on the leash, right? First day, first put on the leash. <clears throat> the first response you're going to have sometimes is the dog avoiding the leash. Because honestly, if the dog is scared of you, he's scared of the leash. So how do we put the dog a leash on to start with? I would recommend to do something that's very comfortable. I would like to grab here a leash without telling my dogs that we're going for a walk <laughs> and start conditioning your dog on the leash. What you will do is start, make the leash very small, put it in your hands like this. Don't let this hang around, okay? Offer your dog a treat, just like that. Give him a treat. Perfect. Give him another treat. What treats do you use? Healthy treats. Some of you can even use dog food. Healthy dog food is as good treat as it gets. And another treat. So give give it the 10 rounds, give him dog 10 treats. And then you're going to show him there is something in your hand and he gets a treat for that too. And your dog goes like, huh, what's that? Oh, that? Oh, nothing. It's just something in my hand. And you get another treat for that. And then accidentally, oops, that is down. That makes things. It moves, right? <laughs> Gives you another treat for that. I mean, it's kind of a funny thing. You kind of look at it and you get a treat for that. So what we teach the dog is to being observant, what you do with one hand and what's happened with the next hand. The last thing you want is to grab the dog by the collar and try to put him a leash on. No, you don't want to do that. So how many of you guys struggling putting the dog's leash on? What is your dog's behavior when he sees the leash? Time to type it in because we're going to talk about that. So if we're not going through the whole process today, we're going to add another session on that soon. I will let you know. However, I'll try to get it quick. We have, we have halfway through. So we teach the dog that this is a good thing to happen and you get a treat for it. I know you guys hate treats. You know, dogs, scientifically speaking, of course, right? Many dogs love treats. Many dogs love affection. It's almost even how many dogs love treats and how many dogs love affection. However, all the dogs who love affection also love treats. And many dogs who love treats also love affection. So no matter what you come up with, either dog treats or affection, I would give them both. Why? Because let the dog choose what he likes. Does he like affection? Give him affection. Does he like treats? Give him treats. I would add one thing in, a, in addition to it, add appreciation. Because no matter if your dog loves treats or love affection, one thing the dog always like is being appreciated. And that's the important part. You guys have to understand that dogs are, are animals that build relationships. And because they build relationships, they want you to establish that first. So it's also important that you understand that if you reward your dog, you cannot just reward with things that you like, is what the dog like. Just because you have cheap treats and the dog doesn't like it doesn't mean the treats don't work. Those particular treats don't work. So we want to make sure that we want to reward the dog, we reward the dog with what he able capable of working with. Now, small tip, if dogs get very frustrated and excited, they don't have a taste in their mouth. So your treat will fail, right? Some dogs who are get very upset about situations, their skin sensitivity lowers because they're going in a survival mode. They don't even feel your touch. Some kids actually may eventually return towards you, right? So we want to make sure that always we do appreciation when we do the training. So you show the dog a treat, he gets a treat, and then you give him affection. Such a good boy. Look at you. You're awesome. I really appreciate you for looking at my treat. So the next thing you're going to do is showing the leash and you don't give the dog a treat unless he looks at the leash. Then he looks at you. Then he gets a treat. Why is that? Because I want the leash to be the reason why he gets a treat. I want him to want that that you have in your hand. Because soon enough, he has to carry it. 
So we want the dog to say, hey, if you want affection and leash and eventually fun, this is how you get it, right? And at the end, once your dog is calm enough and he's next to you and you ask him if he wants another treat, sure. By the way, let me put that click on. Here you go. And here is your treat. Thank you. Now we're ready for the next step. Suddenly, suddenly, we're creating a ritual. Right? And in that ritual, we establish as you and me getting attention. I get your attention and you get my attention. So before we observe the dog's behavior and how he does on the leash, he's a mess, then we're looking for his motivations. What motivates the dog? So motivation is not the dog wants to go out for a walk. Motivation is movement, freedom. And to do that, he needs to get out. And to get out, he needs you. And you need him to be on a leash. All of a sudden, we see we have primary and secondary motivations. The reason why you want to go for a walk is different the reason why your dog wants to go for a walk. So we have to get everybody on the same denominator. Both of you should have fun. And you should go outside because of your relationship. At least. And that makes things fun. So your dog needs to get out, but he gets out because of you having a relationship with your dog. That's important. <clears throat> Because then we need to get the dog's attention. And how do we get attention? We have to teach the dog how do we get attention. So here's my first homework for you guys. And I would like you to do it. And I would like you to tell me about how it went. So the first one, you take two treats, right? And you offer your dog those two treats and then open up your arms. A little bit, little bit more than shoulder wide. And the way you do it, not up here, because he's jumping on you and not down there because it's a short dog. It is between you and the dog on the same plane. One tree to the left, one tree to the right. And here's why. Because right now we're creating a situation. The dog has something that he really likes, primary motivator, food to survive. And now you split those options in two, the right option and the left option. Now the dog has to make a decision, which option should he choose? We want him to choose you to get those options in his mouth because definitely he wants both. And if he goes after the one, that is a no-no. If he goes after this one, that's a no-no too. But you cannot say anything. You have to be quiet. It's a relationship thing, okay? Your dog gets frustrated. He goes, oh my God, oh, two treats. I want to jump on it. Nope, no, that doesn't work either. That doesn't work either. I'm going to pull. Nah, nothing works. Can you help me? Sure, man. Here you go. Both treats. Problem solved. And your dog is like, holy bark, what did just happen? I look at you and I got both treats. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. You want to try it again? Here, two treats. Open up your arms. Which one do you want? And your dog is like, <laughs> a stupid old one. I'm just looking at you. You you do things. Exactly, man. You're awesome. I so appreciate you. That was a good choice. And just now what I did, I gave him three rewards. Affection, appreciation, and the foods that he wanted. So no matter what his motivation is, he is covered. Even if he didn't tell me that. Plus, I give the dog two markers. Facial expression, right? Emoji, and the word good, a verbal cue. So even if the dog has a visual contact with me or an audio contact with me, he knows what's going on. He knows that I rewarded him for what he just did. So I didn't have any tools to convey that information other than me, my hands, and my affection, my treats, my appreciation. That's all the tools I need to convey that information. And what did the dog do? In order for me to solve his problem, he communicated with me. I didn't need the leash. No, I did not need the leash. He did it. He wanted the information from me and I provided it. Makes me what? Important information provider. 
he would be really, really, really wrong not taking my information as important. Why? Because it covers his primary needs, right? So let's go back to the leash because it's important step next. Now that your dog knows that looking at you gets him what he needs, you can show him the leash. Hey, you want more of those treats? What do you do? The dog will look at the leash, look at your treats, and looks at you. And you're like, man, you got this. Here you go. <laughs> here's the treat. By the way, here's the leash. And we're good to go. Now, the ritual begins. The ritual of walk. What does it entail? It entails you and the dog, obviously. It entails the leash. It entails your shoes, your jacket, or everything you need to gear to go outside. It entails the dog's harness, collar, whatever. And then it needs the door. Yeah, you cannot go nowhere through the door without the door being open. So the dog knows that. And as soon as you touch that doorknob, your dog goes nuts. He sits that doorknob, and the moment you go and touch it, the hell breaks out. And then you do what? Then I'm telling you what you usually do. You want to get over it. Quick, 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 quick. Let's go outside because you cannot handle that. You don't. Because the only thing that's going to happen is he's going to jump on you. Some of you guys' dogs will urinate because of the excitement. He's going to bark. You don't want to wake up the kids. The whole drama starts beginning. And what you do, you continue doing that. Don't. Stop doing that. Remember what we talked about before? If your dog wants something, how does it get it? Good. And what do we do that? We want the dog to be calm to do that. And I know many of you says, oh, yeah, I have to be so, you know, calm and um, I should be the bo a boss and the leader and like calm and assertive. No, you don't have to be calm and assertive. All you have to do is calm. If you're calm here and your dog is not calm over there and he needs you to get out, you know what's going to happen? Quantum physics, quantum entanglement, your vibration is attracting your dog's vibration to come to the same level because you two have a relationship. How many times do you have had visitors in your house and they come in like, oh my God, oh my God, I need to tell you what happened. Oh, and this happened and that happened. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Dude, you, you're, I, I'm having anxiety right now. Chill out. What did you do? That was overwhelming. And what did you do? You tried to calm the person down, but people don't pay attention. Once that goes on, it's just telling me, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what you do is you hold space for them and are where they have to go. And you're like, mm hmm okay. Yeah, sure. And as you are coming there and you're not engaging with anxiety, oh, my God, that happened to you? Your husband, your wife did that? Wow. You're there. Okay. I hear you. Good. Once you're done, I'll, I'll talk. We're done? Okay. Let me tell you. One, two, three. And that whole thing comes down. So I want you to do the same thing with your dog. If your dog goes nuts, the moment he does is the trigger that you created because you did one step into the ritual that the dog triggers to get excited and you reject. And your dog is like wiggle butts, you know, jumping, barking, squeezing. You just don't move. Why? Because freezing is an international language of dogs saying, I'm in discomfort. I feel threatened. I feel so threatened I can't even move. Your behavior makes me freeze. So not only that. I actually avoid making eye contact with you because you really scared the poop out of me. So unless you change, I will not be able to engage with you. Ooh, that's a good sit. Here you go. I appreciate that. So the moment gives you regret of his action that triggered you to go into a survival mode is the time to reward. So you forgive the dog for his behavior instantly as he regrets of doing what he did to scare you. 
all of a sudden we have a two-way communication before it was a one-way communication okay you felt good you give information he feels good he gives information now we have a two-way communication he does things for you for you to do things for him that's a big thing so if you're talking about leash walking it's about you doing things for your dog and your dog should do things for you make sense now we have two things going on here we have your dog and you are in communication you're not trying to communicate you are communicating have i used any tools yet did i use a shock collar a prong collar a choke collar any aversive tools that ruins your relationship and traumatizes your dog and i know some of you will say oh man it's one of those guys talking about shock collars a traumatizing dog what the heck are you talking about i'm sorry i know what i'm talking about i used them in the past many years ago and i know what they do actually i'm so knowledgeable about shock collars that i can actually make one from scratch from the drawing board into the production line into the box into your hands right that's my previous education that i have is building things from scratch and market them so that aside all the tools that make the dog not do things prong collars choke collars shock collars anything aversion shake cans spray bottles you name it everything that makes the dog stop doing things and they're not relationship based are doing harm in one way or the other at least they cause fear is that what you want if that is what you want don't bother you're half an hour you wasted your time I wish you well okay now for you guys who don't want to go down that road stay tuned because now we're gonna talk about taking the dog out for a walk and we have to teach him that without force without punishment without fear what we're gonna do is let him be in control and I know many of you will freak out like are you talking about not giving my cane corso or my mastiff control I tried to get control I'm not giving him control there's no freaking way let me let me tell you here if your dog struggles to control it's because he feels not in control so what we want to give him control so he doesn't struggle with it and he wants control it comes through you if he controls you he can control the whole event so we teach him how to control you through a two-way communication so if an employer wants to control his employee what does he do he gives him a clear job description he gives him a good job he gives him a good job environment and then he lets him work if that person doesn't perform he's gonna lose his job is it a threat no that's the reality if I don't perform in a family or in a relationship, I will destroy the relationship. And if I'm dependent on that relationship, I will not risk it because secure attachment relationship is being dependent and trust that relationship. And not dependent in a codependency way. Dependent because the dog cannot do things on his own. He needs you. But he's not needing you because he's forced to need you. He needs you because you are the only way to get there. So we don't want to ruin that. We want to use that we want to use the, the dog's need to comply to you and we give him that power of control you so if he makes you feel good he gets what he needs if he does make you feel good you feel threatened and if you feel threatened he doesn't get what he wants he only gets what he needs so he knows exactly if he wants to get out the door you need to feel good about it and here we go the reason why you touch that doorknob is because you don't feel threatened and your dog will quickly get into that response that soon if he does something that you like he gets what he needs so two-way communication so the more door you open the door the next trigger event happens from the door the door movement gives the dog the area to leave if that happens simply just close the door like man I really want to open the door but your behavior made that door close and I really want to keep the door open I can't and your dog is like oh man I cannot hold my stress I need to get out I know how about you sit good job 
here's another treat. Stay. Let me help you out a little bit. I give you hints. I walk you through the process. I show you the job. Sit and stay, right? If you guys don't know how sit and stay, it's something to work on. Happy to help you with that. You open the door. Once the door is open, you pay attention to the dogs paying attention to you. Instead of looking at the door and the opportunity to leave, watch at the log's legs. If he's about to leave, no, 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 no. You don't let him free until he changes, calms down, his legs are next to each other. He feels good to you. Now I'm asking you to be empathetic with your dog. You know what empathy means? Oh, she, I just cut myself. Can you, can you feel my pain? Right? You want to see blood? No, you don't. That was empathy. If you can tune in with my pain and, oh, did he hurt himself? That's empathy, right? But my action triggered you as much as your action will trigger your dog. So if you're empathetic with your dog and he's up there, you have to go down here. And if he's down there, you have to encourage him because, you know, you guys have to go for a walk. And now we're opening the door and we leave there. So far, what we have is we don't have a prong collar, we don't have a shock collar, we don't have a choke collar, we don't have a shaker can, we don't have a spray bottle, we don't have an air horn. All we do have is a harness or a collar and a flat leash, six feet plus. That's all we do. And what do we do? We give the dog control. If he comes down, I feel good, I do the next step. Step number one, step number two, step number three. So your job and homework for your homework today is to pay attention all these individual steps that your dog sees as next. You grabbing your shoes, you grabbing the leash, grabbing your jacket, grabbing your car keys, your phone, ta 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 all these things adds up because they are part of the ritual. You miss one, like going out with a walk without your shoes, your dog is like, hey, are you okay? Where are your shoes? We're not going anywhere with your shoes. Where are your shoes, man? What are you doing? See, now your dog pays attention to that ritual and that ritual is what keeps things moving. The ritual becomes the motor, the engine of the whole thing, the momentum. So you work on the momentum, the dog works on the skills and you work on keeping that momentum going by helping the dog remember those skills. So you have to break it down, all these individual things in small increments and start working with them, okay? So let me show you how I do that. What we're going to see here is a stray dog that I just met, in fact, yesterday. Let me share the screen with you. Application window. Here we go. And I think you guys can see it, right? Here we go. Well, 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 well. <clears throat> so a couple of days ago, this guy showed up. So let me walk you through the process here. So this guy is set up in my property and he's just a leash puller. And what he does, he doesn't even know to leash. He just pulls as much as he can, you see? And he's a, like a 50 pound dog. Okay, so I really ho have to hold my leash. One thing I do, I don't pull the leash. You see, every time I try always to keep loose leash. And now what we do is we establish what we talked about before. The first thing is we observe the dog's behavior. We're looking for his motivation. So the first thing I see here, he comes back to me. And that is affection. I leave and let him jump on me. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that because I just met the dog. I'm totally fine with just building a relationship. He can do whatever he wants as long as we start creating a bond. I can shape that off later, the jumping. I can tell him, hey, you know what? I really like our first date, but I don't like the jumping part. So the next thing we're going to do is I see that he's attracted to me. He wants my company. I start giving him the best message. Moving backwards and the dog following me, I will use the name come. So as the dog approaches me, I call it come. And I move backwards. I call that come. And then I reward him with affection. 
or treats or appreciation. And you see all the time the leash is loose, right? The dog that before that was pulling so hard on the leash, now is walking loose leash. I'm sending them a message. Hey, coming to me, I call it come and you get affection. It's about you and me having a thing going on. And the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to tell him that you and me are going in the same direction. I call it let's go. So as he comes to me, I make a U-turn and then walk in the same direction as he does. And then I call it let's go. And then later on, we are one minute and 30 seconds into our session. He's already walking loose leash. Okay, of course, he has to mark because he was neutered. He's marking everywhere. And then you're going to observe something that's very important for you to see too. Now, he wants to mind his business. Our relationship ended when he wanted to mark. So his primary drive to mark overrides my relationship at that point. We just had a relationship for two minutes and 58, one minute and 58 seconds. And here he sits. So I have two options to do here. The regular options most people do is yanking on the leash try to get the dog's attention or I do this. I go in a direction that he wants and then I change my direction in the way I want to go. So without force, I keep the dog moving and then redirect the dog in my direction. Okay, we need to, to pee a little bit on that too. That's my future dog rehab center. And then here you go. He gets ready affection, right? So now you see all of a sudden that I stop, he stops. And I move, he moves. And I stop. And he comes back. He checks in with me. In three minutes, less than three minutes, a stray dog that I never met before, I got his attention because I let him have control. There you go. Easy, right? Now he's not pulling. Now he's with me. Loose leash. And my goal is loose leash, and his goal is not to pull the leash and return for affection when he ends the leash. Isn't it great? In three minutes. As simple as that. Any questions to that? Go for it. I'm going to show you another video meanwhile. Because while other people trying to educate you that the only way to train your dog is by wearing a collar and explain to you exactly what the collar does, they're basically lying to you. They tell you, oh, the dog doesn't feel the collar because, you know, the dog's neck, try it yourself. You know, you cannot compare a skin of a human with the skin of a dog. Skin of a human has many, many layers of cells. The dog has only few. And all those nerves are in there. And as much as you th people try to convince me that a prong collar is just a perfect tool because it doesn't cause any pressure, you know, you have to kind of look at the physics. Inch pressure per square inch. A harness, a collar, and a prong collar have, two, have three different pressure per square inch. And a prong collar who has all these tiny little dots cause more pressure per square inch even if it's even distributed around the neck. And by the way, if you look very close here, when you see my error, some of them are so intelligent that says, you, you know what, it doesn't pressure your dog's throat. It goes around it. Even worse, because it actually presses the whole thyroid gland, which is responsible for your emotions as well as your brain. So now we see if you go and look at different types of leash training, everybody suggests prong collars. And they tell you all these debunking things that everybody who uses tells you not to use it. They're just liars and they don't understand how it works. Well, you know what? Unfortunately, just learn a little bit physics and you recognize how it works. Just do some physics. So. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to show you another situation. I'm going to show you another dog. I'm going to share the screen with you. And if you go to my video YouTube channel, which is at Holistic Dog Training, um, you will see that all my YouTube videos 
are not before and after are basically all what I do. You will see the whole video of it. So wherever you go, let's go this guy. On this guy, I work without the leash. I uh, let me see if I can if I added the sound here, making sure that you guys can hear me. It looks like I did. Give me a thumbs up if you guys can hear the sound. Uh, share audio. Here we go. I almost missed it. I got this. Okay. Now sound on. Gonna start from scratch. You are able to see in a couple of minutes, in six minutes, a complete leash training session without even using a leash. And her heads up, this dog is attacking the dog horses, um, the neighbor's horses. Come is him following me and he gets the reward. That come, I will turn into let's go, okay? Come, let's go, good. Let's go and get him the treat. Let's go means you're behind me. We're going in the same direction, same speed, doing the same thing. Come. Let's go. Good. Come. Let's go. And reward. Come. Let's go. You see what I did? Let's go. I basically get his attention. Let's go. I just try to get away from the dog and the dog follows me. I call it, let's go. Good. And reward. Now, when I say let's go, you need to follow me. If, if I have the leash, I'm not relying on the leash. I'm relying to the job description, which means follow me. When I say let's go, the leash is loose or not at all. And you have to do whatever I do. Just follow me. Let's go. Good. So start things no. in your house. Wait. Start things Let's in go. your hallway. Wait. Start things in your backyard. And Let's then Let's go. Wait. Go outside. Good. Wait, Wait means I stop, you stop. Okay. Let's go. Wait. Good. Come. Sit. Let's go. Wait. It's funny, he got frustrated because he was expecting me to get let's go, but I asked him I to sit. <laughs> I can ask sit after the wait. Wait is kind of like, hold your breath, don't do anything until something else comes. Look, come. Did you see what I did? He got distracted. Look, pay attention. And the follow-up command. Ready? Let's go. So let me let me explain to you what happened here. Let me go back to the screen. <clears throat> go a little bit back. So next door, the horses showed up. And we are like literally three minutes into the session. Before that session, we did the exercise that I gave you inside the house and including the hear or attention exercise. Some of you asked that question. And by the way, if you guys are interested, I have a leash class coming up very soon. You can find it on my website under workshops. I highly recommend you guys join that class. This is a class that will talk all in depth. We have two hours time to talk about it. Today we just top, touch the door. Today we touch just the top of it. Okay, so let's walk what's happening here. Hold your breath, don't do anything until something else. There, he just saw the dog. He saw the, uh, the, he saw the horses and he walked away. You see his stance? You see his lip licking in front? I know if you guys have a bigger screen, let me see if I can magnify it a little bit. And there you go. Okay, so he's leaped in front, and the next thing is going to happen, he's going to leave. And of course, I didn't pay attention, right? That comes. Look. And the moment he leaves, he leaves my six foot area. I basically call him back using the exercise that I did inside the attention exercise. I don't need Sid. I can ask Sid after the wait. Wait is kind of like, hold your breath, don't do anything. Wait, as soon as the dog moves away, you're going to say it. Watch, pay attention. Until something else comes. Look, come. Did you, you see what I did? did? Now, tell me what did I do? Type it in the comments. What exactly did happen? Why didn't I correct the dog? Why didn't I use my leash? 
Why didn't I reprimand the dog? Why didn't I punish him for him leaving? Because I used the tools that I worked before that. I was proactive teaching him what comes mean and what does look mean. Look mean, pay attention. I have something information for you. Very important. And he's like, what? Well, come over here. I'll show it to you. I was like, I'm coming. So now his primary motivation to chase the horse is being overridden by our relationship. And my relationship has priority over the other distractions. And that's where I'm coming from. Relationship-based training is much more effective than just positive reinforcement because all you have to do is building that relationship becomes their reinforcements in itself and then the motivation in itself and the reason of your relationship becomes the dog continue being in that relationship and it's a self-propelled situation it doesn't stop until you stop it or something dramatic happens so using those aversive tools all it's going to do is going to make things worse and using all those tools that people tell you to use all it does it will destroy your relationship is that what you want exactly you guys got it thank you for observing and learning from that workshop how do you like it would you join my class? And my class, what we just talked about, was just the surface. You haven't seen the class yet. <laughs> so I guarantee you in these two hours or in that hour that we talked about, what did you learn? What is your takeaway? Were I able to control a dog that I just met, never had a relationship with him? I built a relationship in three minutes? Or a stranger dog who actually had bitten people and goes after horses in the neighborhood I was able to call him back after 15 minutes preparation and three minutes in the field. Like in an hour, I took care of it. Is it just me doing magic? <laughs> no, it's not me doing magic. It's the relationship doing magic. And you have that power. You think I'm going to tell you, hey, call me now because I'm going to solve your problem? No, I don't tell you to call me now. I'm telling you, try what I did. Build relationship. Build trust. Understand your dog's needs and his motivations. See what your dog wants to do. Let him feel in control. Educate him all those steps through the leash that you want to do it. All the things you want to work with him. And then start rewarding that. Your maximum reward is your relationship. And your bonus are the treats, affection, and appreciation. And if your dog is really a jerk, it's because he has a trauma. And it's not because of your relationship. And that is a different chapter. Because if your dog has trauma and lashes out on a leash, tries to kill everyone, it's because he feels threatened. So stop being a baby about it. It's not your problem. It's your dog's problem. And if your dog has a problem, that's your problem. Your problem is your dog's problem. And if you solve your dog's problem, you don't have a problem. So don't tell me your dog is a jerk and you're struggling with it because that's a drama. There is no drama. In holistic dog training, we don't have dramas. We have solutions that come through relationships and through mutual understanding because that relationship is sacred. And you don't have a relationship. You have our humanity has nothing learned over 40,000 years plus living with animals. And if you say dogs are friends, best friends, then we should come to that level and say we are best friends too. And how do we treat dogs as best friends? using aversive tools, punishing them for doing something they believe is necessary to do for them to survive, and then we punish them for them and causing them fear and stress. Is that what we do? That's not best friends. That's worst friends scenario. I know you can do better. I know I can trust you. So homework, do that exercise, get in contact with me, show me a video of you doing it, and I'll tell you if it's right or wrong, if you need some help, okay? If you do need help and your dog is a weirdo, and has issues that you feel like you're, you, it's overwhelming, I can help you with that. But doing that homework, you don't need my help. You just need to do it, and you will see the difference. It would, you see the difference the first three, four minutes. 
You want to bet on that? <laughs> you saw it. I mean, it's nothing is set up. You see, before and after at the same time, before, during, and after are my videos. So you look at my videos, you know what it is. So sign up. And if you want, join the class. I'm going to post the link of the videos. It was a pleasure having you guys here. Thank you for your comments. And see you next Saturday. By the way, I will have a guest. Okay, so stay tuned, sign up, get notifications because you don't want to miss my guest. Bye bye. Thank you, I appreciate. It was a pleasure having coffee with you guys. <laughs> <laughs>